All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, so our next speaker is Fan Boo. Fan Boo is a uh, third year PhD student at Duke. Her work, uh, her research interests focus on stochastic modeling, network analysis, and applied Bayesian methods. Today she's going to talk to us about social network metrics of game success. Um, hello everybody, I'm Fan. Um, today I'm going to talk about some of the work on analyzing optical tracking data in college basketball games. So, optical tracking data. These kind of data are acquired by cameras installed around a stadium. The system can capture a snapshot of the game 25 times per second, so it's really high resolution. The NBA started using this system at the beginning of the 2013-2014 season, and in the same year, some very top collegiate basketball programs started using the system too. So the data we have in this analysis are from one of those top college basketball programs. At each time point, we have a lot of information in optical tracking data. We have the locations of all the players, we have the location of the ball, and we have some extra annotations of the events uh, that are going on the court. And of course, we have some general identification information of the game, the teams, and the players. So here is just a tiny little snippet of the data set we have on our hands. Um, a lot of interesting analysis can be done using these data. So today, I'm going to mainly talk about our paper, Social Network Metrics of Game Success. But afterwards, I'll also discuss some preliminary results from our very recent work. So we're thinking about building a complete uh, analytics pipeline from data extraction to modeling to visualization and allow some feedback between different aspects of analysis. In our work, we are interested in two things. First of all, we want to model the dynamics of a basketball game. In particular, we want to model the dynamics in pass making. And second, we want to develop a metric for game success based on players' interaction patterns. So if you're interested in passes, you can, of course, just count the number of passes made between each pair of players on the team. And you can get plots like these heat maps. So a lost game is plotted on the left, a one game is plotted on the right. The redness of a tile represents the number of passes between a pair of players. If you uh, stare really closely, you can't really discern which is which. You can't see much pattern, you can't see much difference, and that's mainly because by doing so, by aggregating over the entire game, you are ignoring a lot of temporal and spatial information in the game. And of course, people have done uh, research works in utilizing spatial and temporal information from basketball. One example is the 2016 paper by Dan Sarong and collaborators, which developed a multi-resolution stochastic spatial temporal process framework for the transition events in basketball games. And another example is this uh, 2017 paper by Lu Xin et al., uh, which used a continuous time stochastic block model to group players together according to their functionalities on the team. In our work, we use a slightly different approach. We take a social network perspective to look at all the passes made between players in a game. So for us, a pass is kind of like a manifested link in a dynamic social network. We introduce some random effects to capture the higher order latent patterns in players' pass-making behaviors that cannot be captured by temporal elements or spatial elements alone. And in doing so, we developed a social network metric uh, to describe players' pass-making tendencies. And as it turns out, this metric can tell us the differences between a loss and a victory. More specifically, our method is a combination of ideas from two different classes of models. The first class is this multi-resolution stochastic process framework developed in that 2016 paper. And the second class of methods is the random effects models previously designed by Peter Hoff to model network links. Uh, so, following the stochastic process framework, we look at the dynamics of a basketball game as a stochastic process, and then a pass made by, uh, made by a player 
to another player is just a jump event in this stochastic process. And we are interested in modeling the risk function of this event. Um, just to be a little bit more formal, we define this indicator function that takes the value one if there is a pass from the ball carrier I to a teammate J at a certain time point in a particular game. Otherwise, it's just zero. And this risk function we are interested in is just the instantaneous probability of this event, of this pass. We assume that this risk function is log linear with respect to a bunch of different factors. First of all, the time-varying covariates. Those covariates include whether or not the ball carrier eye is dribbling the ball at the moment, the distance between the ball carrier eye and the potential receiver, the teammate J, the openness of the passing angle from the ball carrier to the teammate, and so on. And it also depends on some spatial functions. So first of all, the sender spatial function, which describes the ball carrier eye's tendency of passing off the ball, depending on his location on the court. And second of all, the receiver spatial function, which describes the teammate J's tendency of receiving the pass from the ball carrier eye, which depends on the teammate J's location on the court. And finally, but most importantly, the random effect term. So uh, this random effect term is mainly just an inner product of two vectors in an R-dimensional latent space. This pair of uh, latent vectors are the sender effect and the receiver effect. This using the sender effect describes the ball carrier eye's overall propensity to send a pass in a particular game. And this receiver effect thing, this V vector, describes a teammate J's overall propensity to receive a pass in a particular game. So just to recap, we assume that the instantaneous probability of the occurrence of a pass is dependent on three different things. Some temporal stuff, some spatial stuff, and then some leftover higher order latent stuff captured by our latent sender effect and latent receiver effect. And then of course some random noise. Uh, if you know the 2016 Servone paper, you will notice that the temporal term and the spatial terms are very, very similar to those used in that paper. But in our paper, we use a different method to estimate the spatial functions. And that method is really easy to implement. It works kind of fast, and it produces reasonably good results, which I will show just in a minute. So to fit the model, we have to figure out three different sets of unknown quantities. First of all, the sender and receiver spatial functions. Second of all, the linear coefficients for the time varying covariates. And then the sender effects and receiver effects, those latent vectors. We first estimate those spatial functions and then conditioned on the spatial functions, we estimate all the other parameters. Just to make our life slightly easier, we simplify the form of the receiver spatial function. We make the assumption that if two players share the same basketball position on the team, they have basically the same tendency of receiving a pass from a ball carrier player I if they stand on the same spot of the court. So for example, if two players are both forwards of the team, we're saying that they have the same tendency of receiving a pass from the ball carrier I if they are on the same spot of the court. We learn those spatial functions using a method uh, which is called thin plate splines regression. It is basically just a regression method that produces smooth two-dimensional functions. Um, you, can, you can just um, use a function in an R package to implement this whole thing. It doesn't suffer from uh, constraints or boundary conditions. It produces a rather smooth and good results. So those are two examples of the learned spatial functions. 
um, the left panel shows the standard spatial function for a particular player i. The redder the color is, the higher the send off tendency is. So we see that for this particular player, he really likes to send a pass when he's standing just outside the middle three point line. The right panel shows the receiver spatial function for a forward on the team. So when a forward is standing outside of the right side of a three point line, he is very likely to receive a pass from this particular ball carrier player I um, in that particular game. Um, if you are familiar with spatial statistics, you may think that you can estimate those sorts of things using some sophisticated methods such as uh, Gaussian Markov field. But in order to do that, you have to think about complicated boundary conditions. And we've actually found out that in practice, uh, those sophisticated methods are cool, but they might actually be an overkill. And simple regression stuff actually works in this case. So now we have, all the uh, we have all the spatial functions learned. We're ready to estimate all the other parameters. To do that, we implemented a fully Bayesian inference procedure, namely a Gibbs sampler with a Metropolis step. Uh, for all the non-Bayesian audience uh, here, uh, a Gibbs sampler is just an iterative algorithm. Uh, in each iteration of the sampler, all the parameter values are updated one by one. But when updating the value of one particular parameter, all the other parameter values are fixed. And, and that's basically what we call sampling from a full conditional distribution. Uh, however, when a full conditional distribution is very hard to get or evaluate, we have to do something else instead. And that's what's, what's going on in the third step, this metropolis step. Uh, we do not know the exact values of those risks, but we kind of need them to estimate all the other parameters. So we propose a candidate set of values for those risks and we evaluate their fitness compared to the data observed. If they look kind of good, then we tend to accept them as the new set of values for the risks. So after running many iterations of this algorithm, we now have a set of posterior samples of the parameters. And those samples can tell us how, uh, how large or how small the parameters should be in the model. To validate this model, we run some simulation experiments. So uh, the fake data, the simulated data, are synthesized using covariates extracted from real data sets, but with some parameter values that are chosen by us. In that way, we know the ground truth and we can actually evaluate how good the model can figure out the parameter values. Uh, we compare our full model labeled by this latent word uh, with two other competitors. The first competitor is the model without the random effects. So there are only the spatial terms and the temporal terms. The second competitor is a model with only the spatial functions, but without the temporal terms or the random effect. Uh, we compare those three models using log likelihood on the training data and log likelihood on some held out testing data. You can see from this table that our full model outperforms the two competitors. Finally, on the real data analysis. Just to recap, we have optical tracking data from a top college basketball program. This data set has 25 frames per second from a basketball game. We fit the model using all the data from the 2014-2015 season played in their home arena. So in the next slide, I'm going to present the learned latent sender effects and latent receiver effects for 10 players on the team. And I'm going to contrast those effects uh, between a lost game and a one game. So here are the plots. So basically what's happening here is that a point on a two-dimensional plot represents a learned, sender, uh, a learned effect. A blue point is a sender effect. 
a red point is a receiver effect. The left panel is from a lost game. The right panel is from a one game. Um, so for two players, player I and player J, if I's blue point is close to J's red point, then there's a very high propensity for I to send a pass to J in that particular game. So let me uh, walk you through this process by showing you an example of two players. So this player A is represented by his code name 601140. This player B is represented by his, by his code name 842297. Their ID codes are both plotted on those uh, plots. So on the left panel, in the loss, we see that player B's blue point is close to player A's red point. And that suggests there's a very strong passing link from player B to player A. But the opposite cannot be said for those two players. So we are sort of seeing that their passing behavior is imbalanced, is one-sided in this lost game. However, in this victory, we see that A's blue point is close to B's red point, and vice versa. So in this victory, their passing behavior is uh, two-sided and is more balanced. And in general, this kind of difference is true uh, for almost all the player pairs on the team. And I'm about to show you that. So, um, in one so in those heat maps, what's going on is the tile in the ice row and J's column represents the inner product of player I's sender effect and the player J's receiver effect. The redder the color is, the higher the propensity is for I to send a pass to J in that particular game. Uh, same as before, the last game is on the left panel and the one game is on the right panel. We see that overall, on the left panel, in the last game, the colorings are less red. And that means there is a lower level of passing activity between all the players in that particular game. And we see a higher level of variation across all the col colorings of the tiles. And that means players' passing behaviors are slightly more extreme and more variable in the last game. In comparison, in the victory, we see that the colorings are generally more orange or more red. And that means um, players have a higher level of passing activity in that victory. And also we see a slightly lower level of variance across all the tiles. And that means players' passing behaviors are more balanced, more consistent, and more measured in that victory. I want to emphasize that those latent center effects and receiver effects are uncovering something different from the raw passing counts. So the left panel is the plot I showed before by simply counting all the numbers of passes made between players. But the right panel is from the slide before. Um, and moreover, as is shown in the last two slides, the sender effects and, and receiver effects are more informative about the differences between different game outcomes. So in our model, we have included a lot of information from optical tracking data. Um, but of course, more information can be included in analysis. One very obvious example is the defensive play. We have implicitly included the defense, the visiting teams, in the time varying covariates. But it might actually help us a lot if we explicitly include the styles of the defense, the visiting teams, into the model. And another example is we actually can consider uh, including more player-specific general information. Uh, like the player's height, or uh, their stride, or their age, and so on. Uh, next, I'm going to show you some preliminary results of our attempt to um, explore more depth of optical tracking data, and then thinking about building a comprehensive analysis pipeline of basketball. So in the past summer, uh, me and my collaborators organized a data science program 
uh, we in recruited four teams of talented and sports-loving undergraduate students to perform various aspects of uh, college basketball data analysis. They did things from data extraction to modeling and then to visualization. And we encourage them to interact um, across teams and give feedbacks so that they can improve together. Uh, I'm really proud to say that they did fantastic work and they have produced some very promising preliminary results. So the data extraction team actually set out to do what the previous speaker um, has already done. But of course, they're just undergraduate students. Um, their goal is to extract player movements and ball movements from broadcast angle, publicly available video footage of basketball games. They um, actually made some very, um, very delightful and quite tremendous progress using CV techniques, including instant segmentation and the human key point detection. So they can actually separate the players from the audience in the stands by cropping out the court so that they don't suffer from uh, recognizing too many people in a video frame. We had two modeling teams. The first modeling team developed two different metrics for evaluating the quality of offensive play while explicitly accounting for the defensive side. The first metric they developed is called the expected points per shot. And that is used to evaluate different players' abilities uh, to make shots. And the second metric they developed is called the off-ball gravity. And that is used to describe an offender's pull over all the defenders on the court when the offender doesn't have the ball. So it's kind of a metric for the danger level of an offender. The second modeling team aimed to predicting basketball events on the court in real time and in an interactive fashion. They used sequential neural networks to do the job and they also developed a uh, interactive web app uh, as a user interface. The final team, the visualization team, they designed a comprehensive set of static and dynamic visualization methods to summarize game statistics, to compare games in parallel, and to help with further analysis. So um, this is a, a snapshot of their R Shiny app. You can actually go on the site and click all the buttons and see the results they have produced. So to conclude, uh, in our work, we have already developed a model to describe dynamics in basketball games. In particular, we have developed the model to capture higher order latent patterns in players' pass making behaviors. The latent sender effects and receiver effects we have introduced they are actually associated with the game outcomes. And I've talked about this point. Um, in future, uh, we are considering incorporating more information in a reasonable and efficient way to help modeling. And from what we have done in the past summer, we want to say that optical tracking data are obviously valuable resources for research, but they're also valuable resources for education and scientific training. And in the future, we hope to do more on that regard. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Fan. We have time for a few questions. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, I saw on your interaction between passer and sender heat map a non-zero value for a player passer and a, a player, like the same player passing and the receiving. What does it mean for, um, if it's like the same player as the passer and the same player as the sender, what conceptually does that uh, mean? Oh, you mean the diagonal values? Yeah, the, the heat map. Um, when the passer and the sender were the same person, why was there a non-zero um, interaction term? Oh, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. That thing should actually be zero instead. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Any other questions? Nate? Um, that was really a great talk. Thank you. Um, I was Thank you. 
It was cur I was curious to see, um, you had the single game, uh, win versus the loss, mm -hmm. um, kind of networks and showing those differences. Yeah. Did you see those patterns show up across a, a larger sample of games? Yes, that's a really great question. We see that same pattern across victories a lot, but in terms of losses, we're less sure because this particular team is so good that they rarely lose. So we only have a very limited number of losses to look at. We can only say that this pattern is true for the losses we have, but we can't say it's true for all the losses they've ever had. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sure everyone else is trying to figure out who Okafor was too. Any other questions? One more. <laughs> so, so I, I, have w I have one last question then for you, which is sure. when you're doing this, I'm wondering if you thought at all about thinking about how passing trends changed over the season. Oh, that's a great question. But technically, we can just introduce another layer of hierarchy to model the changes between seasons. And yeah, if we have the computing power, we can certainly do that. All right, let's thank Ben one more time. Thank you.